I'm here with Lori Herring, and I am so excited to talk to her. She is one of the founders of the Alabama Compassion Coalition. She also really did a lot with the law in Alabama that they were trying to get passed to prevent children from, um, from accessing treatments that harm their bodies in order to help them present more to be um, something that they're not. It's called the VPAC legislation. So I just wanted to talk to her about her involvement with that and her experience with, um, with this issue. It's such an important issue. So welcome, Lori. Hey, thanks, Erin. Thanks for giving me this opportunity. So can you just tell me a little bit about what your role was in the VCAP legislation? That's the Vulnerable Children and Protection Act. Vulnerable Child Compassion and Protection Act. Yes, get that compassion in there. Get that compassion in there. <laughs> That's right. Well, um, fall of 2019, we went to an Eagle Forum conference in Washington, D.C., and there was a group there from Arlington, Virginia, talking about how this issue, the transgender issue, had impacted their school. And it was just really hard to believe that this kind of thing was happening in America. So when I got home, I thought, I don't think they're doing that kind of stuff here in Alabama. I mean, I just don't think they're, they're doing this um, puberty blockers. So I started researching. I'm a nurse. I've been a nurse for 33 years. And so I started researching and lo and behold, they were doing it in Alabama. Um, our children's hospital in Birmingham uh, has a clinic, the M. Lala clinic, and they were uh, doing uh, puberty blockers and they were doing transsex hormones um, not yet doing the surgery but referring them to surgeons who would do it <clears throat> so when I, I brought this to uni smith and to our board of eagle forum of alabama um, margaret clark who's our legal counsel said we need to do something about this so we started a meeting with eric johnson he's another lawyer in um, in Birmingham and we started meeting uh, the beginning of November trying to flesh out a bill a legislative bill that would prohibit uh, any doctor from prescribing or giving puberty blocking drugs or transsex hormones to a child under 18 18 or under and it took us months of work and research and meeting together in person and on the phone to flesh out a bill um, to present to the legislature in the spring of 2020. Um, and also during that time, we had another Eagle Council meeting in January where again, the focus was actually on this kind of sexualization of children which is harmful no matter which way you look at it. Children are not little adults. Their minds are not little adults. Their bodies are not little adults. And they do not have the capacity to make this choice with all its ramifications that will change their life forever. Uh, they don't have the ability to make that. I mean, they still have magical thinking. They want to be a unicorn one day and they want to be a you know, brain surgeon the next. And that's why we don't give them the opportunity to make these kind of choices. But for some reason, the people think they should be able to make a choice to amputate healthy body parts when they're 13 years old. And that is child abuse. There's no other psychological issue that we treat with surgery. And we, we used to do lobotomies and we learned that right. lobotomies weren't okay. And that's the only right. other time I can think of that we use surgery to correct a mental health issue. Right. Well, yes. And in modern day, there is nothing else mm -hmm. that we do surgery on to create it, to correct a mental decision. Um, so we've written the bill. Um, we presented to the legislature. We had a wonderful reaction. We had, momentum going and then COVID-19 hit. So um, we were right at the point of being able to get it voted on in the House. It had already been voted on in the Senate and passed. So we had one more vote. 
I believe the governor would have signed it, but now we're not just in limbo, we're back to square one. And now the opposition knows what we're wanting to do. So. One, one of the things that I ran into when I started talking about these issues and my concern about the medical transitioning of kids, this is giving them things that permanently damage their healthy bodies. And people would say, oh, they don't do that. They don't do that. That's not something you have to worry about. You're just making that up. They don't do that till a child's 18 and, and they're um, able to give consent. And I was just wondering, um, you said you didn't realize it was happening in Alabama. When yes. you approach legislators, how many of them knew that this was going on? Oh, the only one who knew, well, he didn't even know it was going on, none of them. And in fact, that's one of the issues that we had to, to face before we presented our bill is evidence that it is happening in Alabama. So what I did was I called the M. Lala Clinic at Children's Hospital in Birmingham and I told them I was a pediatric nurse, which is true. And I, I told them that I was wanting information. If I had a family came that had come to me wanting information about this, I needed to know, are you prescribing transsex hormones? Are you prescribing puberty blockers? And I had a, lot, a long time where I couldn't get through to anyone. But I finally got through to this lady, and she was um, very forthcoming. She freely admitted, oh, yes, we do that here. Yes, we have many, many patients that we do that with. And I said, well, I mean, how young do you do this? Are these just, you know, older teenagers? Oh, no, no, ma'am, these are children. And I said, well, how young? I mean, do you do it to a nine-year-old? Oh, yeah, we have nine-year-olds. Eight-year-old? Yeah, we have eight-year-old. I said, well, surely it's not done with five-year-olds. Well, yeah. And so I had my confirmation. And, and this was the day before our, our bill was going to go in front of the conference. So that's, it's so interesting to me that, um, that you're a pediatric nurse, because I can imagine you've worked with children. And so you've seen children who have had difficult mental health issues. How would you, just based on your experience, how would you say that we should handle these kids um, instead of giving them medical treatments that are going to permanently damage their bodies and reinforce the idea that that, that self-hatred that they have of themselves is um, reasonable? Because really what you're doing is, is affirming that self-hatred when you say, oh yes, right. you're born in the wrong body. So based on your experience, first of all, I'm curious with both emotional and with medications, when you choose to medicate a child and when you wouldn't, and, and how you deal with kids like this. Well, depending on the age of the child and the ideas that they're bringing forth, you want to try to find out what's behind that. Because they're not just uh, pulling this out of the air. And the studies have shown that the young children who start thinking that they're a, a different sex have usually had some kind of event that has precipitated that. Either it's something that their kids at school think is cool and they're just going with a social contagion or possibly they've been a victim of abuse. So you need to, to be able to sit down and talk with a child and see if you could find out what started this. Um, now, true, true um, gender dysphoria, there is a, a condition called gender dysphoria, and it's about 0.02% of the population. So that would mean two people in a thousand have this. And but the studies show that if you give them supportive care, if you support them through their puberty and reaffirm that their body is what it's supposed to be, that help them to feel comfortable in their body, that by the time they're an adult, that dysphoria will have been taking care of itself. Um, and certainly if you've got an older teen, um, you need to find out what has precipitated this and help them understand that this is not something that you can just change your gender. 
You know, you need to talk with them, talk the truth with them. You need to counter the lies. And unfortunately, this has become such an issue in our culture. I don't think there's anybody that can say they don't know someone that has been touched by this issue. We have friends who their children were raised in a, a very loving, very close, evangelical Christian homeschool family, and it's touched them, one of their children. Um, through social contagion, decided that she was not supposed to be a girl, but she was supposed to be a boy. And that's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking for the family. It's heartbreaking for the, for the, for the friends who don't know how to deal with it. Um, but most of all, it needs to not be an option that they can go to a doctor and get these permanent uh, conditions. Um, they can social transition if that's what they want to do because that's easily reversed. But they should not be able to be used by those who want to promote these kind of values, uh, used by them in in their medical treatment, which is what's happening. They're you know, being used. I, I can't think of, I mean, we talked about the surgery and lobotomies that used to be given and then they realized that was that was just completely horrible. And mm -hmm. I'm thinking about the medications. Now we're giving children medications that permanently change their bodies when they're very young and, oh, yes. and, and cause them to be less functional and less healthy. Is there any other case in medicine where we do that? Um, well, we've made mistakes before. <laughs> And that's what this is. This is, it began as a mistake and now it is a perpetuated um, so experiment with our children in real life. The drug that's used most often is called Lupron. It was developed um, back in the eighties to treat prostate cancer in men. Okay, this is a very powerful drug. And, and what it does is it blocks the female hormones so this is usually given to um, girls who think they are boys and it's given to them prior to the onset of puberty okay so we're talking eight years old nine years old and what it does is it blocks all of the female hormones it it effectively locks them in a child's body i always it call it the i call it the peter pan drug because it, right. it locks them into childhood. And it's not just the physicalness that it locks them into. Of course, it delays puberty, which also means that the ovaries do not develop. It also means that the brain, the frontal lobe of the brain, which is the part that matures between the ages of 14 and 25, is locked into a child's way of thinking. and the opposition will tell the, tell the parents lies. They tell them that this is fully reversible. If they change their mind, well, they can just stop taking it and they'll just go through puberty. That is not true. That is not true. You, actually, can stop, you can stop taking it, but the effects are permanent. Right. I actually was looking at the side effects of this drug and it's horrifying. Um, a lot of women actually who took it for endometriosis are, are um, actively trying to get it removed from the market because they had such horrible side effects from it, just debilitating lifelong side effects. It destroyed their lives. And, yes, and that's besides the effects they're giving it to them for. These are, are negative side effects that no one would want. Um, and they have been trying to get this drug off the market, even for treating cancer, because it has such lifelong um, debilitating side effects, joint pain, um, tissue damage, um, damage to the ovaries or the, or the, um, the testicular damage. Um, and these are things that can't be reversed. And you're going to do this to an eight-year-old? That and is then just childhood. 
all of the research that I've read, these kids go on, um, 100% of them go on to cross sex hormones. And so if you've taken puberty blockers and then go on to cross sex hormones, your reproductive organs are going to be permanently damaged. And even if you decide to go off the hormones, you're going to be having to take hormones for the rest of your life because your natural um, system for producing hormones is going to have been destroyed. So these kids are in essence going to be addicted to these drugs for the rest of their lives, which is horribly sad. And also, aside from the side effects, just the cost, these are really expensive drugs. And it's, um, it's, it's so sad to me that we are giving kids these drugs that are so damaging and they're so expensive. And then people who have other medical conditions are being denied treatments because they can't afford to pay for the drugs. And so it's a lot of cases, insurance companies and Medicaid are paying for these drugs, but they aren't paying for drugs that actually are really necessary for some people. Right, and the, 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 some of the effects from blocking, arresting puberty, and then beginning um, the child-owned cross-sex hormones, and that would mean that a, that a female, an XX female, would be taking very high doses of testosterone, and an XY male would be taking very high doses of estrogen, causes irreversible changes in their body. Um, we have one young lady that's in the Compassionate Coalition, and she transitioned to a male when she was 18 years old, took cross-sex hormones for a year. It almost killed her. And permanently, her voice is lowered to that of a man. Now she's realized that it was a mistake, and she's trying to reclaim her womanhood, but she will forever be speaking with a man's voice. And it bothers her. And, yeah, and she was allowed to do this by doctors who were either uh, misinformed or they have an agenda. And that's the, that's the strange thing is um, it does seem like there is um, either it's money. They're just really into it for the money. Um, it just is shocking to me that we have doctors who are suggesting that there's sort of a, an essence of woman or an essence of man that can somehow get born in the wrong body. To me, that's just such metaphysical thinking, um, supernatural. It doesn't make any sense, um, especially when then they say, you know that you're a male or you know that you're female if you adhere to these stereotypical kind of regressive behaviors. And to me, it's really telling kids, if you don't, if you don't conform to these, to this box of what a very stereotypical girl or very stereotypical boy is, that you're actually um, transgender, you were born in the wrong body. And that message to tell kids just seems so damaging to me. Um, Because what it's saying is if you're even a little gender non-conforming, if you don't follow that very um, rigid idea of these stereotypes, then, um, then there's something inherently wrong with you. And to me, that's just heartbreaking to tell a child that. Oh, yes. I mean, puberty is a confusing time for healthy children, mentally and physically healthy children. I mean, I can remember when I was going through puberty, looking at my body and thinking, who am I? This doesn't look like me. And you can just imagine during that confusing time, if somebody came up beside you and started acting like they cared about you, and started saying, well, you feel that way because, you know, you're, you're a mistake. You were born in the wrong body. You're, you're, you're a freak, but we can help you with that. Well, a lot of these children do not have affirmation at home. They may not have a healthy relationship with their parents. They may be bullied in school, and they're looking for some way to fit in. And they get such affirmation that they get such attention from people that they think yeah that must be what's wrong with me even though their rational mind knows that that's not true they're so starved for attention that they're willing to chop off healthy body parts in order to get that attention it's really heartbreaking it it is heartbreaking and i realized you know i was thinking about this when we were working on it i was thinking you know there was a time in my life I could have been persuaded, I think, 
And I think, I think if we're most honest, of us could. I think yeah. most most kids go through a time where they feel that dissonance, that disconnect with themselves, where they're you know struggling with something. And, and that's true. I mean, that's true for everybody. It's part of the human experience. It's part of figuring out who you are as an adult and leaving childhood behind you. And instead of helping them through that, they're trying to lock them into childhood and then make them live in a fantasy world, which eventually they will realize is not the real world. And then they're left with the carnage from what's happened. And there really no isn't support for them. There's no support for these kids afterwards. They're often attacked and marginalized, and they can't even access services to help them, you know, undo some of the damage that was done. I just and was I curious. So oh, sorry for the parents. The parents are lied to at every turn. I mean, their child comes home and says, you know, Betty comes home and says, I feel like I'm no longer a girl. I'm a boy. My name's Billy now. And so they do what any parent would do. They take them to a quote unquote expert. Okay, well, you know, let's take her. Maybe they'll talk her into it. They get in there and the, the therapist says, well, you know, you're probably right. And we do need to change your body. And we do need to. And the parents are left going, this makes no sense. But the children are coached to say, if you don't do this, I'll kill myself. Well, what parent's going to go, oh, well, I'm going to call your bluff on that. No, they're going to do anything they think they need to do to keep from, keep, to keep from their children harming themselves. And it's, it's I, such emotional blackmail. It is emotional blackmail. That's exactly what it is. And, and it's abhorrent that these children are coached to do this, if not by the health professional that they go to, they're in contact with groups online that tell them exactly what to say in order to get what they think they want. It really is turning upside down the authority. I'm just thinking about your role as a nurse. And um, if you were working with a pediatric um, patient who insisted that they were a boy when they were a girl and you refused to use those that child's preferred pronouns and names and you actually could now get in trouble for that i'm seeing doctors and school teachers get in trouble for not following the following what this child tells them they have to do so we're we're investing children now with this huge amount of authority and i'm thinking what kid wouldn't want to um be able to tell adults what to do basically that you get you have to sure. you have to use my name you have to use my pronouns you have to treat me how i how you how i want to be treated and that's really harmful for kids oh yeah i mean every kid wants to live in a kid centric world where the whole world revolves around them that's a part of human nature but we as parents we have to you, you're not born thinking well i need to talk, i need to to look at the health of my friends and my family first no, that goes against human nature. And we, we as parents have to teach them that they don't live in a kid-centric world. But when your child threatens to kill themselves, well, they do have the authority in that. And, and they'll try to bring out these statistics that say, you know, if you do what they say they want, you know, this will go away. And the statistics actually just prove the opposite. It's true, and especially the long-term the statistics. Yes. And by the time you've figured that out, it's too late because you can't go and do what's been done. So in any other circumstance, why, in any other circumstance, if a child threatened suicide, what would you do as a nurse? Oh, well, if it was a, you know, we would, we would try to determine, um, is this a, just a fleeting thought or is this something they have planned for? And of course you would want to take them to a mental health professional, but unfortunately the mental health profession may be the one that gave them that idea that, you know, you need to say this in order to get the, the um, care that you need. And, and what's really, what's really just heartbreaking is in many States, the therapist's hands have been tied and they, they are by law not allowed 
to counsel that child in a way that doesn't affirm their delusion, which is so backwards that you basically therapists kind of word for it. Therapists are now legally mandated to tell a child that it's possible to be born in the wrong body and to affirm that the self hatred that they have is normal and appropriate. To me, that's just shocking that we can tell therapists that this is the appropriate way to treat a child with these issues. Our society has got to hold our ground and push back on this because these are, um, there, there's much behind this than what meets the eye. Um, there's, there are agendas behind this and a lot of it has to do with the breakdown of the family unit. And a lot of it has to do with um, the obsession with, a, with abortion that many have in this country. Um, the obsession that there should be abortion at any stage of life and now even past birth. Well, and um, I think that when you, um, you give a child this idea that, um, that it's, it's okay to take medications at really young ages that will impact their fertility, that will make them infertile for life. I really see it as, as part of a, a move to, to sterilize our children, which is eugenics, oh, yeah. which is something that we have historically come out fighting against. We don't support eugenics in any case. And yet this is clearly what we're doing is um, a form of eugenics for these trans kids. We're making them sterile. And um, to me, I just can't figure out how it is that anybody is sitting, sitting down and, and, and not concerned about this. Um, before we go, I wanted to just switch gears a little bit. And I have this, <laughs> this is a little symbol. Um, I've seen that somewhere before. Yeah. So Lori, um, tell me a little bit about this. I have one of my own, um, but I wanted to really promote the Compassion Coalition. We are now an international organization and it started out with wow. you in Alabama. And so wow. um, I was, I just really want to, um, first of all, thank you for coming up with this. This is such a great symbol. Tell me, tell me a little bit about what it means for you. Well, we were sitting, um, having dinner the night before um, the first um, legislative, uh, I'm sorry, legislative um, commission meeting on our bill, on VCAP. And um, we were with some of our witnesses we had flown in and spouses and those of us on the legislative um, council. And we were thinking, you know, we should have some sort of symbol for our movement. And so we, we brainstormed, well, maybe a ribbon. Well, yeah, there's a lot of ribbon campaigns out there. You know, how are we going to make ours different? How are we going to make ours identifiable? And then I thought about, you know, compassion is about the heart. And the red is about love. And so um, we were trying to decide quickly on the fly, can we have something done by tomorrow morning? And this was like 8 o'clock at night. <laughs> Um, and I thought, well, I could get little wooden hearts and some red ribbon and some little pin backs and I can do this. So my husband and I stopped by Hobby Lobby on the way home and we bought the supplies and he helped me spray paint about a hundred little white hearts and we hot glued them together. And that's how we came up with um, Compassion Coalition pin. And I just really want to emphasize the compassion in this. Because I think a, a lot of us who are speaking out about these issues get labeled as bigots, as transphobes, as, as people filled with hate. And, you know, I can attest, I come from a very different background than those in the Eagle Forum. You know, I grew up in a very liberal home, very tolerant. Um, I was bleeding heart liberal. And when I met the people at the Eagle Forum, I was just overwhelmed with how compassionate you really are that you that you're not doing this out of hatred you're doing this because you love children you love people you want them to be healthy and have um, a safe life where they can really thrive and so I just I think it's so important to emphasize that compassion component 
Well, compassion is not reinforcing a sick child's delusion. That is not love. Mm -hmm. That is not love at all. Love is speaking the truth. Love is supporting you until you get better. Love is putting boundaries around what a child can do and not allowing the child to do dangerous things. That's why we teach children not to touch stoves or put a fork in an in a outlet because they're curious and they want to do it. But children need boundaries. And unfortunately, adults need boundaries around children because there are adults who do want to hurt children. And so we are, we are motivated by love. We're motivated by our faith in Christ. And we're motivated by the love of children, the love of our state, the love of our community, and the love of our country. Um, if we can't keep this wholesale destruction of our children at bay, um, what do we expect is going to happen to our country after we are gone? Yeah, I and can't imagine the more kids grow up feeling like, well, one of the things that, that that's happened as a result of trans activism is that little children, really young children, as young as you know, preschool, kindergarten age children, are now talking about their genitalia on a regular basis in a way that um, really is confusing and difficult mm -hmm. for children. And so they've been able to really um, infiltrate our schools. And I see this as grooming as someone who yeah. has had experience with sexual assault and abuse. I really feel like we're teaching children, first of all, their parents, the enemy, don't tell your parents, mm -hmm. keep secrets from your parents. And mm -hmm. also the fact that they're talking about genitalia and, um, you know, making it an issue that, that, that you go to a different adult to talk about. You might go to the adult who's running the LGBTQ club and talk to them. And, or you might go to um, take your kids to drag queen story hour where you have sex offenders who are mm -hmm. reading to our children. So I just see it as, um, you know, you ask what's going to happen to our country. And I just see it as this increasing sexualization of our children oh, and they're losing the, uh, the ability to, to understand what consent is and to set those really important boundaries. It is. And, and it's really sad when the school system pits children against parents and, and you think, well, I live in Alabama. I mean, we're a quintessential, you know, compassion, um, conservative state. You know, we don't, it doesn't get any more conservative than Alabama. It can't be happening here. But we do have a family in Alabama that's part of our, our coalition. And he found out that his son had been going to school, changing his clothes into women's clothes, going by a female name. And it had been going on for a year. Oh, wow. And the school did not tell him about it. Now, you tell me what other serious mental condition. That's a that's actually against the law if you interpret the law correctly because they are mandated to report um, any kind of child abuse or neglect or, or dangerous situations the children are in. And they actually conspired to hide this from the parents. And so this child is probably accessing the bathrooms and locker rooms of the opposite oh, yeah. sex without oh, yeah. parents even knowing it, without their parents knowing it, or the other children's parents knowing it. Right. And I can't emphasize enough that if you do have your child in a public school setting, that you have got to really dig deep to see what's going on because they do this stuff under the cloak of many, many different subjects. It, I mean, it's in every subject. They, they weave it in and out. I attended a meeting um, in Birmingham um, and it was a meeting where they were talking about transsex issues. It was led, it was for the honors students for the University of Alabama and Birmingham. And the leaders of this discussion was a woman from Planned Parenthood and a man who um, identified himself as gay. Now, these are supposed to be the experts on this. And the woman from Planned Parenthood openly admitted that she would find um, 
a way to get into the schools purport, purportedly to talk about something else. And then what she would talk about is abortion and transsexual issues. Um, and people so may not know this, but Planned Parenthood now will give children um, puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones. They will mm -hmm. give um, adults these, they don't even have to have a therapist's note or anything. It's called a informed consent is what they call it. But they, they, they no. I could, I could walk into a Planned Parenthood clinic, and I could get testosterone today, mm -hmm. and I don't think a lot of people realize that 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 this is happening, <clears throat> and especially that it's not all the clinics, but that more and more of these clinics are um, providing these drugs to children as well. well. I actually called Planned Parenthood and asked them, how could I get a hold of puberty blockers for a child? And they referred me to the Mlala Clinic at Children's Hospital. And that's so sad because par that gives parents actually a degree of comfort. If Children's Hospital is doing it, it must be okay. And it's just so sad that, that they have to watch even that area. They can't trust it. Well, and that's, um, that's what's really scary, I think, is that, you know, as someone who has always you know, grow, growing up being a Democrat, growing up on the left, I always thought that I could believe what the media says. I thought I could believe doctors. I thought, you know, all of this was, um, you know, I never questioned any of this. And as a result of my involvement in this issue now, I am just constantly questioning. I don't know what to believe. I don't know if I believe what my doctor tells me anymore because I know now that doctors are lying about the effects of these drugs and they're telling children that it's okay to get on them. I don't feel safe going to a therapist because therapists are now legally mandated to lie to children. I don't feel comfortable with a lot of our teachers because they're willing to lie to children and parents. And so it really is a breakdown of our society when, when truth becomes fiction and fiction becomes truth. I can remember reading George Orwell's 1984 in 1980 and thinking, no, not in my lifetime. Mm -mm, yeah. No way, no way could that happen. And how sad to know that it's, it has happened. We're living in that world of Orwellian speak. And I can only hope that our efforts will change that. I just heard that the United Kingdom is going to stop medically transitioning children, which just made me beyond elated because um, we're a little bit behind them, but the fact that they're starting to question this is really good. We have um, children who are now adults who are suing their doctors for, for doing these horrible things to them. And we have people like you who are um, putting so much effort into standing up and protecting our children. So thank you so much, Lori, for your efforts and for your compassion for kids. And I'm just, if somebody had told me a, a year ago that I would spend so much time researching and talking about transgender issues, I would have said no way. But it, it really is a become a passion of mine because the truth is important. And, and our children's health is important. Right. There's, there's, our, I mean. Right. We're, we're, we're sacrificing our children to the idol of humanism and to the idol of um, that we know what's best. And, and it's a lie. It's a lie. We're sacrificing. And it's, I a think lie. a lot of it's big pharma too, that these um, companies are making so much money off of this. Um, and it's unconscionable that we would allow people to make money off of damaging our children's bodies. Well, and the Bible speaks of, of, the, of the time when people will no longer tolerate hearing the truth when it's easier to believe a lie. And, and like I said, I don't necessarily fault the parents. And if you're going through a situation like this, just know there, there is help. There's help out there. You're not alone. There are many, many, many families who are going through this, have gone through this. And they're willing to, to stand along beside you, to walk with you, to help you navigate the system. And the and Compassion Coalition brings a lot of these 
these different organizations together in one place where you can find them. And I'm so glad you mentioned that. And I'll put links at the bottom of the, the description of this video so that if, if there's a parent watching who needs some resources, they know where to go. If there's a child watching who's struggling with these issues, they have somewhere to go. And Lori, thank you so much for sharing your expertise and insights. And thank you for all you're doing with the Compassion Coalition um, and spreading word about what, what is happening to our children.